my name is Anastasia. I'm really happy to moderate a panel discussion today. I'm game release uh, lead at Innovax with seven years of experience in game release and project uh, management. And uh, Innovax is leading global engineering company with offices in uh, New York, uh, London, Tel Aviv, and Ukraine. Okay, um, let's start our panel. Uh, today we will speak about best ways to make a hit uh, in hyper casual and main insights, recommendations on it. And surely I would like to represent our speakers. Um, the first one is Constantino, is uh, VP product at uh, Tap Nation. Um, next speaker is Mreb, business development lead at uh, Lion Studios by Applewin. Uh, also, Gabrielle will join us a little bit later, I hope so. And Shirley Neer uh, is Senior Publishing Manager and Crazy Hubs uh, Lead at Crazy Labs. Okay, um, so let's start our panel from uh, introduction. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself and your company and who would like uh, to be a first. I can start. Uh, so, hello everyone, nice to meet you. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm uh, Costa. I'm a VP product at Tap Nation. Uh, I actually joined quite uh, recently. It's been about uh, two months, maybe slightly more now. Um, so, um, Tap Nation is a hyper casual publisher, uh, like uh, my other colleagues here. Uh, we are based in France, a uh, two year old, more or less, uh, so starting 2019. Uh, and in general, as a as a hyper-casual publisher, I would say that um, our strong, I would say, main asset is to be very focused on ideation and try to bring a lot of uh, value added to the developers we work with, with a very like uh, personal and uh, supportive approach. So that would be a bit a quick presentation on my side. Okay, thank you. Who will be the next? Take over. Yeah. All right. And yeah, thanks for having us here. And uh, my name is Emre. I'm with Lion Studios for the past two and a half years. I'm based in Berlin and I'm responsible for our business development in the EMEA and Turkey region. A bit on Lion Studios, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, it was founded by Applevin uh, a bit over three years ago and based in San Francisco, has offices in like five more countries. And in the past three years, we published 150 successful titles uh, with talented studios in all around the world. And like we keep counting. Okay, thank Hi, you. Hi everyone, I'm Neil from Crazy Labs. Um, Crazy Labs, as you all know, is the top three publisher, uh, mobile publisher. We publish everything, not only uh, hyper casual, but hyper casual is our uh, main subject today. Uh, I'm there for a few years and uh, in the gaming industry for more than 20 years. And lately, I think we have more than five top charts games. Uh, uh, in the stores, maybe seven from today. So it's pretty hectic around here. It's not every week like this. And uh, we are happy to uh, join this session. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, okay, thank you for introduction. Um, I propose to jump in the next part of our panel, we have a few questions to discuss. So actually, first and general question is, what is a hyper-casual game now? Well, I want me to start. Um, well, hyper-casual, as always, uh, is a game that uh, the marketing cost is uh, cheaper than the money that you can earn from video ads. It doesn't matter if it's a racer, if it's a runner, if it's a squid games based game, anything goes almost, but maybe not zombies, but anything else. Uh, if it make, if it, this business model can make money, it's a, it's a, it's a game. It's a hyper casual game. If it can't make money, it's not fitting this subject. Uh, I can add a little bit on that. Uh, I don't think the definition has changed many, uh, like in the past uh, two, three years. Uh, on top of Nier's point, it's thematically uh, 
any concept that has some mass appeal. Uh, it would rather not target a very specific demographic uh, cohort uh, of audience and uh, like zombies, as Neil mentioned. And, uh, <laughs> and mechanic wise, I would say uh, it's like the mechanic where every player is the best player. Like they can just, you know, uh, be the best without spending any kind of effort. Yeah, I, I align with the, the other two definitions. Uh, I would add on top of that in general that hyper casual games are definitely the ones that you can play and switch off your brain completely. Uh, I think whether it's more towards idle or it's more towards satisfying games, in the end, it's something that you can do without thinking too much. So that's definitely something, it's a common trait that most hyper casual games have. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, how much does it cost to create a hyper-casual game? Your thoughts. Well, playing chicken each time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it depends for who. If it's for the developer, it could be uh, even free because, well, time is money, but uh, you only need to invest his time and his, of course, experience and knowledge and skill, but we have studios that are doing it from their home, from the parents' home, from the sofa, on the parents' home living room, and still succeed to make a top uh, child's hits. Uh, some of them continue to live on that sofa after they became millionaires, but not all of them. Uh, but this is the idea. Everyone, everyone with the skill and, and talent uh, could do it. I think this is part of the magic of Hypercasual. It's for everyone and could be made by almost anyone. Uh, ah, the question was about the money. So the other part of it is the cost of marketing, which is the uh, is publisher uh, responsibility. And that's of course also depends. Uh, and it's funny because as much as the game is more popular, it costs more to market it, or it could also go the other way. Uh, as if we can spend a lot of money on marketing, we will make more money of the game. So this balance uh, keep any game with different price. We cannot just say it. But for the developer, it's kind of very cheap. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, and maybe quickly to add on that, you know, uh, I totally agree that it depends on the expertise and talent of the team. You know, the same game could take four days or four weeks, uh, depending on the know-how that's accumulated in the team. But maybe, uh, one quick advice to uh, keep an eye on the cost is that uh, I think it's really important to spare time in the beginning to um, to store the information that you, you make at each game. So uh, the the storing this means like creating templates for the team to reuse all the time, creating libraries for codes and assets. Uh, like for for the beginners, it looks like a sort of a burden. You know, you know, I'd rather make another game is the most frequent mindset. Uh, but I mean, people who does this like benefits really much uh, afterwards uh, in order to not to repeat the time cost, so to say, uh, and save a lot of uh, money in the end. Okay, thank you, Constantino. Yeah, uh, I had the exact same point as Emre. I think that the like the cost of producing uh, every next game where you're into uh, hyper casual becomes lower and lower uh, because obviously, for example, if you're making uh, runners, you can make Plenty of them just changing the assets a little bit, switching, like uh, twisting the mechanic. So yeah, definitely the it's difficult to put an exact cost, obviously because the salaries are different in every country and like costs of the of the assets and everything. But yeah, like the um, in general, um, I, yeah, that, that's more or less what I, I agree with the guys. Okay. And a small thing, uh, if, yeah. if I may, uh, we only develop games that are going to be successful. We don't develop games just for the developing of the game. So in the beginning, we just develop a prototype. It takes a few weeks, usually, or even days. Some uh, developers can do it in, in one day even. Uh, not all of them succeed, but those that succeed, all, this, all the ones that succeeded started as a one day, one week game. So it's also part of the thing. Of course, we need to count all the time that we invested, not only the time for the one that succeeded. Maybe it took us a year to make a hit. And this year, we made a lot of games. So again, it's complicated, but uh, it depends. Yes, I fully agree with you. 
Okay, thank you guys. Uh, the next one question is, where could we get more users for our games? Uh, could you name uh, main resources? Do you mind explaining slightly more the, the question just to make sure I understand what you mean, like uh, new type, like new players that we could reach for, for Hypercasual? Yeah. Is there, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, like many publishers, studios are talking a lot about like a hybrid games, like a hybrid casual, this type of genre. I think that having games that have like less invasive uh, uh, ads in general, uh, for sure, is something that is going to attract some users that right now are not really into games with ads, obviously. Uh, interstitials, especially reward videos are much more welcome. Um, but uh, for sure, like these games that go more towards casual as well, uh, that's definitely something that's uh, that's happening. So some some players from casual will come. Uh, but I think definitely as well, like some more players from uh, from console games as well could be could be coming. As in general, the development quality of the games that we see in hyper casual is starting to be very high end, uh, visually speaking, in terms of mechanics and everything. So I think that you know, like uh, at the end of the day, some hyper casual games are not very far from a Nintendo game. So I think there's definitely space for new players to come. OK, thanks. Uh, well, since most of the hyper casual players are not gamers, they are players. They, they don't consider themselves gamers, at least the, the mass, mass of them. Uh, we do use different methods of trying to get to the mass audience. For example, YouTubers, Twitchers, uh, even TV shows, if it's related, uh, and also we do the other way. We do we make games that appeal for mass appeal from the first place. Uh, as you as you all know, that the Squid Games uh, phenomenon is, is going crazy on the charts, and there are many games based on this TV show. Of course, most of them without any IP uh, approval, but uh, uh, Squid Games like game, and uh, they did it on the other way. They found what people like to do to watch Squid Games on Netflix, and then they make games that will appeal to them. So one of the, the, the methods is to search for a game that will attract people and not the other way. Yes, thank you. Great example. Yeah, actually, not, not much to add to this topic, but I mean, if you're also a question involves the, uh, the sources for acquisition, uh, it's, it's, it's broken down mainly in like social and in-game networks are still like, uh, you know, leading the majority of, of the user acquisition, I would say. And it's heavily dependent on the game, on what strategy to pursue there. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, I still see a big stake of the, you know, uh, a big stake in the in-app networks uh, since, you know, they have like the majority of the players already. And also socials do a great job in like expanding the player user base. So they acquire new players to the ecosystem. Um, but these balls are the main sources still. OK, thank you. Uh, the next topic is uh, hyper casual mechanics, uh, how they work and which one are profitable. Um, maybe you can name uh, successful examples. And again, I think it's a, it's like the other question, the the, other, the first question. Um, we you can get many answers for these questions. All of them could be true, uh, and but it, it's a little complicated to say a mechanic as a profitable thing. Uh, of course, games that you can play for more time, for a longer time, or maybe even say games that people will come back to play again uh, could be more profitable than games that have some kind of narrative, for example, and in the end, they just finished. So of course, we continue to add content, but let's say a game was a definite thing, and not uh, updatable. Um, so I think uh, it's not about if it's a, a swipe-based game, or if, it's, or if it's a tap and release game, it's more about the content or the theme or the story that inside that would make a game more profitable or not. Uh, of course, it's also, it's not for every game. There are games that are based on a very simple, basic uh, mechanic that works. Of course, Hell is Jump is a great example. No story in that game. Uh, and still, it's one of the best games ever in Hyper Casual. Um, so this is how I see things. Uh, maybe we can get an answer from a different uh, direction. 
maybe quickly I can uh, jump on this. I think that, like, yeah, uh, as Nier was saying, you don't have like a more profitable mechanic per se. It's more about the right fit in general, the right mechanic for the right theme. Uh, definitely. I think that it, like some mechanics have the particularity of being, for example, very satisfying in their nature. Uh, if you take, for example, stacking, like this type of mechanic, uh, obviously has has an attraction to it, even without anything around, right? You remove the environment and everything, stacking cubes is still, there's something satisfying in it. Um, but uh, to say how that would relate directly to profit is a little bit di uh, difficult to say. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's more or less how I see it. Maybe stacking boot, uh, loot boxes will make profit. Exactly. <laughs> um, to to add on that, I think uh, you know mechanics is one of the important pillars, just one of them, uh, uh, as we all discussed. However, like speaking uh, specifically on the mechanic, I would say uh, we would focus on something to do, uh, something very very fun, not only to watch but only to do. And stack is just one of these mechanics as well. So it's just, you know, uh, when you get a comment from a player that would say, uh, I'm playing this game, but I don't know why. Uh, it's just, you know, it's it's a really good mechanic that's, you know, placed in the game without any narrative or without any meaning. But uh, the player finds his or himself or herself like playing for 50 levels in a heartbeat. So uh, that feeling portion is pretty important. And in the past year, I've seen uh, the otherwise uh, being a bit of frequent mistakes a little bit uh, because, you know, I think uh, we can have the tendency to focus on what's more fun to watch and like uh, very quickly convert that into an idea. And uh, sometimes it can create into very passive experiences in the game because, you know, we can replicate the exact scene and it might be pretty tempting and we might like, you know, end up with very like, you know, good CPI numbers since it's, a unique theme. Uh, however, like if the if it's not fun to do, like unconsciously, uh, then you know we cannot get the engagement piece right. So we cannot get the profit profitability part. Like that's tied to the mechanic portion. Yeah, I could add that obviously in, in hyper casual mechanics need to be extremely intuitive. Uh, like uh, you can't expect someone to download the game and understand that it has to be played like a FIFA game, right? So it has to be something very simple, uh, obviously. Uh, but I think that, yeah, like, for example, something that can be uh, something that we don't necessarily realize when we think about the idea, but it can have some uh, some impact as well. For example, if you have a mechanic that requires you to hold your finger on the screen, for example, versus just tapping, holding has the advantage, for example, of having a haptic feedback, right? Uh, so that kind of thing, for example, can have quite some impact on retention and ultimately, uh, or playtime and ultimately on, on profit. So I guess we could argue that there are some more profitable mechanics. OK, thank you. So we could jump in next one topic. Um, your recommendation and life hacks for beginners. Um, is it possible to launch a hit hyper casual game in two weeks? I can start on that. I think it's possible, I would say. I mean, it's doable, but uh, I wouldn't want anyone, anybody to get this as a benchmark. Like, uh, are we going to like go and launch a game in two weeks? Uh, because, you know, there are many, many portions of it like uh, uh, that could get out of control, you know, in like, for example, like SDK integrations, teams can face with bugs, you know, and any bug fix can, you know, take additional time. So, I mean, things can go out of plan. So uh, I'll just wouldn't set uh, that time frame as a benchmark. And... I will narrow like in my my view into one single recommendation, as many of other people will have also. Um, I would suggest uh, new beginners not to rush into ideas. Uh, I think I, I see that being made uh, very commonly uh, because you know due to the nature of the you know market, it's it's a very competitive space and it's even getting more 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 and more busy. And uh, we have this tendency to just do it right away. And like, you know, we get an idea, I have to ship this in a week. Uh, so first thing first, like if we have this urge that we have to be very fast about it, probably it means that this idea has been, is, is easy to be replicated and probably other people are also thinking about it. So uh, that might be not that unique and it might not end up in being very, very successful in, in some uh, KPIs later stage. And very importantly, 
if we think we have a good idea, uh, we should start developing the game after we also have some vision for the game uh, that we can build a structure to expand the game quickly uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a successful test, you know. Uh, if we don't like have a vision of level 30, for example, when we when we start developing a game, uh, and then you know it might end up you know even remaking the game after it's successful because you know after we build it to to some portion, teams need to you know add a feature, but the structure may not enable it, so they have they might lose a lot of time and start from scratch. So uh, that might look a little bit like a waste of time in the beginning, but uh, having a straight vision on what it might look like in the future if it's successful. Uh, is an important uh, life hack, I would say. Uh, yes, I think. Uh, uh, sorry, you want to start, Constantine? No, you're going uh, to go ahead. I think my, 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 our record was one month and one week uh, with soap cutting uh, two years ago. Um, but as, as uh, Amber just said, I don't think it's a good thing to try to, to make a record in that case. Uh, what could happen is even if you make a hit and it go to the top charts, let's say it's in the, in the top one position, uh, you will make less money out of it. Uh, if you rushed into it, you don't have the the time when it, when you are in the pressure of the of the top charts. You want to, to stay there as much as possible, and it's very hard to do it if you don't have the infrastructure for that. So I think uh, it's more uh, uh, smart to invest the minimum effort in every step. So it could be quick to, for the first uh, CPI test, for the first day one test, etc. And maybe it will be quick, but all the time to think about the next step, as Emre just said, and even think about what happened if the game will become a hit. What, what kind of content do, do I need to, to add? How, how do I make this game uh, survive the, the top chart uh, uh, Battle Royale, uh, as, as, long as, as long as possible, of course. And uh, you can see games, we have this game Amaze, for example, is in the top 30, around top 30, for more than two years. Now, today, it was almost impossible to, to think about this game, to make it in two months, and, and then stay there for two years. You know, it's almost impossible. Uh, it's very hard to find new mechanics, very hard to find new, new themes that make this effect. So I think you need to think about the goal, not about the record, not about to be number one. And of course, you can also be number one just by buying users, by buying more, putting more money on the market without, without a profit. And of course, this is not the, the goal again also. So uh, be focused on your biggest goal, be focused on the target, how to make the most of your game, how to squeeze that lemon and not just being there quick. Maybe it's a good PR uh, article. Yeah, you know, I definitely agree. I think, like, uh, to also see the other side of things, I think at the same time, obviously, you want to be as fast as possible while not sacrificing uh, quality. I mean, that's still, like, I think that time is still a very important aspect of uh, developing hypercarrow games, obviously, uh, especially if you're doing Squid Games games, I guess. <laughs> In that case, you really want to be fast. <laughs> Um, but uh, well, yeah, to, to answer the question whether it's possible in two weeks, I think it is uh, possible. And as the guys were saying, not necessarily recommended because it's very hard to make something that is, uh, you know, with a very good like long-term retention, especially if you want to, which is what ultimately brings profit to your game, right? Um, but uh, as Emre was saying earlier, uh, I think that here again, a bit like for the, the cost question, um, like if you become very efficient at like launching games uh, a lot of things are in common from launch to launch right uh, so you will have ultimately to integrate like similar sdks and that kind of stuff so there again if you can build templates if you can build efficient processes uh, the next time around you encounter a good cpi you you can launch much faster than if you didn't do that okay thank you guys and the next one question is, um, where could we get more ideas and inspiration for developing uh, new game items? Netflix, obviously. <laughs> um, I'm, so, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it changed my life uh, in a way, this hyper casual in crazy industry. I'm, I'm in, in TikTok, in Instagram, in YouTube all day. 
my, my, I, I have the strangest TikTok feed ever. I have a, a smelly feet all the time because we had this foot, foot clinic game. I had crazy acrylic nails. I don't do any nails ever, almost. Uh, so, you know, just look around, see what people like to see, see what people like to do and try to gamify it. Try to take something that is, for example, is a mess, slime, uh, tie-dye, whatever. Something that when you do it at home, it's messy. But if you can try to gamify it, you can still get the same or similar experience without the mess. It could be a great thing to do. People will like to do it and not mess their home. Um, so try to find the, the, the secret sauce. It's not easy to do, of course. We are trying it all the time. We succeed, but not as many as we try. And um, sorry, um, but uh, uh, the, the thing is to try to open your eyes, open your ears, ask your friends. My, my, my daughter keeps sending me ideas all the time. My mother even, uh, not so good ones, but maybe hyper, uh, hyper, hyper casual, maybe it will work. So uh, I think it's all around us. We just need to open our eyes. We also have, um, we can call it a, a inside feeling about it. You know, we have eyes. I'm, I'm sure Constantino and, and Andre could, could understand what I mean. We have the eye for it. After so much time investing in it, you see something and it just jumped to our eyes. Maybe we should make it again. Yeah, uh, totally agree. I think that uh, literally everything you see, not only on social media, uh, as saying, but again, uh, like just around you in life, uh, like here on my table, I have a plastic bottle. Plenty of games made on plastic bottles, right? Like as, as soon as it's something that is in everyone's life and common thing, uh, and you can also add some kind of fun and uh, satisfaction to it uh, and the possibility to gamify it, then you, you have a hyper casual theme. Uh, obviously, as well, like uh, pop culture, especially when it's very recognizable. So, for example, uh, I feel like a Squid Game was done for hyper casual, right? Like you have those red suits, like those masks, super easy to recognize. Uh, and so, yeah, like I think we should all be on the, on the lookout as well whenever something new comes out that uh, has this kind of theme. But like a yeah, superhero like uh, theme has been everywhere in the charts for, for a few years now. Um, so, yeah, like uh, those things. And obviously, I mean, one that... Uh, uh, all of us do a lot, I think, when we look at each other's games, twisting other things. That's uh, obviously a, a super strong source of inspiration. Okay. Uh, yeah, also to add on the inspiration piece, uh, I agree with all the points that all up for. And um, there's no secret sauce. And like, if you know, we, like, we won't tell, uh, probably. But I mean, uh, I, the, the thing we can do is just, uh, just I can just provide some tips in, in ways to think uh, when looking for an inspiration. Uh, the, the, the start of the game, like ideation, uh, more likely like it looks like feeding the marketability of the game, if we would say. Uh, it consists uh, from three pillars, three main pillars. Uh, it's theme, art, and mechanic of the game. So uh, I believe that thinking these three in different ways and getting inspired for these three pillars in different ways uh, could help like maybe discovering something could break it down and it might be easier to discover uh for instance for themes i totally agree like you know netflix any kind of social feed like any live event would be pretty helpful uh you know we can we can build uh, some mechanics around it and that would be really nice and for art styles uh i think top charts are really good source for that and not to like you know make a game that's in the top charts but you know make an analysis of what kind of art is working because it's a trend shift that can, that can be something just fresh with the art and like, you know, that could make a really good difference uh, as just one of the pillars. And uh, speaking of the charts, you know, uh, it's not a good practice, uh, like to focus, like very, like get inspired very heavily from an idea that's up there, but it's just the good part to see, you know, what's working in it. I know making practices in terms of art uh, is a good way to tackle uh, the top charts, I think. And for the mechanic portion, I would say um, maybe games that are not very hyper casual could be a very good source of inspiration uh, for mechanics. I, I, I'm pretty sure like many people in the industry are uh, gamers for a long time. 
And you know, uh, it can be a very small piece uh, of a game that wouldn't even consider to be on mobile, like it could be a console game. And uh, a very small portion of that uh, could inspire us to build a mechanic. And we can build, combine that with the best practices of the hyper casual and mobile nature uh, from the other research stuff. And we got inspired earlier. And uh, I think that's an important part. I and mean, getting the mechanic uh, would also consider, like, you know, what's the main feeling that that mechanic triggers and, like, you know, play around with it to simplify in the you know, form of a mass audience. Just to add colors. To what you said, colors is also a great thing to find in the top charts. And uh, Constantino also said uh, Nintendo. Nintendo is like a hyper casual console. It's like 90% of the of the of the mechanics there, especially Mario mechanics, you can find them all over the charts. Uh, it's someone already tested that people like it, people get attracted to it. Now we need to make the hyper casual version. Again, it's not so simple, but it's a way to find. Crazy Love's uh, most secret uh, uh, is uh, our greatest trick is to convince everyone that there is no secret sauce, but there is. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Uh, we have two topics uh, to discuss. Uh, Nier, um, do you have uh, more time or should you leave? I have a few minutes until the yeah. kids okay. will fill the class. <laughs> okay, so um, let's jump in uh, next question. Um, what could make games unique and profitable? Uh, maybe you can um, name uh, successful cases and examples. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I talked a lot. You can go. <laughs> no <worries. laughs> me too, me too. Uh, so uh, I think I like in general in hyper casual, uh, unique and uh, and profitable uh, are kind of words that that go together. I think that uh, like in like all new games that usually come out or very often they always have something new they're bringing uh, because you're you need to surprise your audience in order for them to to download. If it's the yet another game that they've seen before, obviously they're not going to download it, right? So like uh, uniqueness, uh, novelty is uh, ultimately what's, uh, what brings profit. I think being a first mover in hyper casual often is very strong advantage. Uh, like uh, I remember like in some of the games I tested, I feel like uh, whenever we would have something that was very different from the, what the rest of the industry was doing, that's when we would get some you know crazy CPIs and retention. Uh, so yeah. No, near if you wanted to go next. Or oh, Near, please go I think, ahead. Uh, you can also go the other. Oh, sorry, sorry. You, you were frozen for a second. Um, so maybe it will be my last uh, answer. So thank you all, everybody, for listening to me till now. Of course, they continue to talk. Uh, I need to go. Um, so just to answer this, uh, I think uh, what makes something unique and profitable is something that is unique but could be. Uh, easily understood through the video of the game. If you can make a new mechanic, a new theme, something uh, uh, something that no one uh, did before, or at least different enough, but you can also emphasize it inside the video ad, then this is what will make you the video ad profitable. And then, of course, you need also to make a game using this uh, mechanic and make it uh, diverse, and etc. But it first starts with a good video. Uh, we, we have some games that start with a, with a, with good uh, retention, but usually it's much harder to try to load the CPI than to start with a game that have a good CPI from the beginning. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. Um, just add, add a quick note on this. So on the, on the uniqueness, uniqueness piece, uh, I would like just, um, I feel like the stock market and the gaming industry are pretty similar. Uh, so I'll just, you know, touch on a, you know, frequently done mistake again. Uh, so once once we have an information and once it, once everybody knows something and information is available to the public, like a, like a stock price hitting the top, and that, now we're aware of it. And then after that point, there's not much chance for anybody to make profits because it's, it's already done, you know, uh, you know, when we feel like Bitcoin is at the top, we don't buy it there, right? So uh, when a game is at the top, 
So it's it's very it's not the right time to do make something similar. And also in the case of Squid Game, for example, uh, we will see how profitable each game on the chart uh, will end. This might be a different uh, practice since it's very much based on the game. It's very much gamifiable. Uh, but for example, the milk crate challenge was a disaster, right? So uh, we, we we saw that last last month, and like you know everybody jumped into it uh, while the trend was at its peak, and then you know we we saw five games and. Um, we don't see them anymore, right? Uh, so it was a very really quick rise and fall. Uh, not to say it's not a success. People can try this, uh, but you know, if you're touching on the pro profitability piece of this, and profitability at scale uh, wouldn't come from something that's already at the top. So we need to, um, you know, find ways to understand what might be like going upwards before it's at the top. Like we want, you know, have a clue why this is at the top today and what are the, you know, motivations for it. Uh, in the in the in the audience, and if you get to know the audience, we can know what will be coming the next. So actually, that ties to the profitability portion. Okay, thank you. As I can see, Nier has left. Um, anyway, thanks him uh, for a contribution. Hope to see uh, Nier on next hyper casual events, and uh, I wish him uh, all the best. And the last one question is. Uh, what next for hyper casual games? Um, could you name main uh, future insights and uh, upcoming year trends? I can start. Um, I guess, like uh, like as uh, Emery was just mentioning, I think that uh, still a lot of studios will be focusing on trying to catch trends, uh, social media trends, pop culture trends. It's something like uh, it's definitely like we can see how that brings it's maybe not necessarily going to be like the uh, the biggest profit in terms of games but they're kind of like a safer uh, shots in terms of uh, like you know uh, like money for your for your time spent as in like if you did a squid game right after the the, the show became very popular the probabilities of having a low cpi on that were quite good right uh, versus i want to innovate completely and invent a game from nothing could be an amazing CPI. It could be very bad sometimes. Uh, so I think that still that's gonna that's gonna happen. Uh, and obviously TikTok, the rise of TikTok, all games that you know um, are fit for the TikTok audience in general. But now it's become very broad. But like yeah, TikTok games for sure will will keep uh, working a lot. And on the other side, I think we're seeing like this uh, these games uh, hybrid casual like these that are having more depth. I think that many. Uh, studios that were, you know, like a few few years ago, not very experienced uh, and everything now are big teams with many people. And it makes a lot of sense for them to uh, use their knowledge of the industry and also their resources to add more depth to the games and ultimately uh, much more profit in the long term. Um, yeah, to add on the future of Piper Cash, you know, it's a very... Uh everybody has some opinions on this you know is it fading away it's not it's not so uh the way we see it is like uh it, it it's it's not a you know part of the market that is shrinking or something it's it's it will always be there and uh in in the past years it's very much fragmented i would say so the competition is really really fierce so um it's not only the cpis it's also the other engagement metrics because there are many good good and better games every day in the market. So like, I mean, people start to play the games even less, they can churn earlier. That competition is a part of it on top of the product itself. So it's 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 getting harder for, for all the teams to find. And um, this is normal under today's conditions. So the way to battle this, uh, you know, stuff is to have games with really, really high engagement KPIs. So I think, uh, the challenge is to focus more on the product uh, in the in the in the upcoming in you know year year or years to say, and um, you know it all ties to the previous discussions. You know the engagement is also about the mechanic, the progression, and uh, so that's a part to focus really well. And recently, I think I see I agree that the trends we will see more games that are based on trends, uh, but they can sometimes. Uh, Take us into a deception that that's the only way to you know market things in the market. Uh, you know, if we take a step back, you know, in, in the past years, we are in this thing to you know uh, pro with something 
new and you know entertain people in like you know unique and different ways so uh if you like just can't relax and you know uh you know try to you know pursue our vision like everybody pursues the vision when they first start their company i think we will uh be able to find more and more games uh that switch this new industry standards and in particular i think uh, we might see uh more puzzles and physics puzzles again uh in the upcoming year uh to uh support these you know uh you know new conditions in the market uh, with strong engagement titles and i think we'll also see that arcade will be shifting into like new forms like new new you know maybe mixing with other genres like you know having new sophisticated you know uh game layouts for for the arcade titles i think we will see many teams uh continue to focus on you know uh, expanding the field of arcade Okay. Actually, you say uh, that's all uh, regarding topics. Um, I would like to say thank you for all your insights. Um, I'm strongly sure that uh, they might be useful in future of hyper casual. And uh, thank you for your consideration and contribution. Hope to see you on next uh, hyper casual events. Thank you very much. It was a, a pleasure to be here and to participate to the panel. Yeah, Th thanks for having us and thanks for like putting a lot of time on the questions and the organization. Uh, see you next time. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye.